One of Asia's longest serving and most influential leaders was also one of its most controversial and feared dictators. On this edition of 101 East, we examine the legacy of Suharto, Indonesia's second president. To this day, Suharto divides opinion. Was he the kindly father of development who shepherded his nation from the chaos of founding President Sukarno and into relative prosperity in the 90s? Or was he a bloodthirsty dictator responsible for the slaughter of tens of thousands of his people? In a moment, we'll discuss Suharto's legacy, but first, this snapshot of his years in power. When Suharto forced Indonesia's first president, Sukarno, from power in 1966, few would have imagined that Suharto himself would be ousted 32 years later. After all, Suharto had marked his rise to power by obliterating the opposition, Indonesia's Communist Party, then Asia's second largest after China. The mass slaughter of as many as a million communists and fellow travelers defined the general's new order regime. It was an Indonesia that Ibu Sulami came to know well. Because of her membership of the communist women's movement, she was jailed for two decades with 13 years in solitary confinement. After Suharto fell in 1998 and before her death in 2002, Ibu Sulami founded a group of former political prisoners to map the mass graves so surviving family members might have some idea where their loved ones were buried. Tujuan saya itu agar kejahatan masa lalu itu terbongkar, kejahatan orde baru itu terbongkar. Sebab waktu peristiwa 65 itu atas perintah Soeharto itu diadakan pembunuhan, pembersihan, penyiksaan seluruh Indonesia. Suharto built his regime around a national philosophy called Pancasila. Belief in one God, a just society, unity of the state, humanitarianism, and respect for social welfare. It was a well-meaning philosophy, but one which Suharto often manipulated to suit his political needs. Under Panchasila, religious extremism was suppressed. Radical preachers like Jamaa Islamiyah's spiritual leader Abu Bakr Bashir was forced into exile. Suharto's clampdown also saw the massacre of Islamic protesters in Jakarta's portside suburb Tanjong Priok in 1984. Unity of the state was often quoted as a reason why East Timor could not become an independent state. In 1975, the US gave the green light to Indonesia's invasion of the left-leaning former Portuguese colony, fearing it might become another Cuba. From 75 to 99, it's estimated between 200 and 300,000 East Timorese died under Jakarta's harsh rule. But Suharto was also seen as one of the political giants of the 20th century, and Indonesia's elite was prepared to turn a blind eye to the strong-arm tactics and the allegations of corruption that surrounded the man they called the father of development. However, they were less willing to accept the excesses of his children and his grandchildren. Just how corrupt, we may never know. A criminal trial against him for corruption was abandoned because of his ill health. A civil suit brought by the government sought 1.6 billion in damages and returned assets. The corruption watchdog, Transparency International, estimates that the figure could be as high as $35 billion. But for former Singaporean Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, the figure is unimportant. Yes, he gave favors to his family and his friends, but there was real progress, said Lee. What's a few billion dollars lost in bad excesses? He built hundreds of billions of dollars worth of assets. Joining me now in our studio are the respected journalist, commentator, and former presidential advisor, Wimar Butola, former student activist, Mugiento, who now runs an organization searching for those who disappeared during the Suharto regime, and joining us from Jakarta on satellite, Dr. Emil Salim, who was part of the Suharto government as chief economist and advisor for many, many years. Gentlemen, thank you all thank for joining you. us today. Um, Dr. Salim, you were an economic advisor uh, and part of Suharto's economic team for a very long time. I want you to respond to Lee Kuan Yew's assertion that the draining of funds uh, that apparently took place under the Suharto regime was as nothing 
compared to the amount of economic growth that occurred while he was in power. Do you think that's a fair comment? No, but actually, you must see it in a longer perspective. When you only take the last part of the Suharto regime, then you have a distorted picture. At the beginning, in the late 60s, Indonesia was in shambles. There was a high rate of inflation. You can compare it with Zimbabwe today. And there were practically no, uh, the government was not running. It was a failed state. And therefore, the key question at that time was how to overcome all these difficulties, economic difficulties. Uh, you must see it in, in that kind of time perspective. All if right, you well, only take one portion, the late portion, then I, the picture will be rather distorted. Well, clearly, Indonesia at the time was in serious trouble and something had to be done. But was the slaughter of uh, up to a million people, many of whom were not probably even communists, was that the way to do it? Of course not. Uh, the thing is, most of us no. at that time uh, didn't know it happened. And people like Emil Salim, who were in the government, also didn't in inform us that those atrocities were happening. We had to learn from the West later on. We have a very high uh, respect for Emil Salim and his colleagues for bringing uh, sound economic concepts and democracy to Indonesia after 66. And democracy was in Indonesia after Sukarno's time for about two years. And then it all went uh, downhill. Well, let me and pause. I, I differ with uh, Emil's point that uh, the last years of Suharto are used to distort the early years. It is the last years that count because those are the years when he mass murdered people in East Timor, mass murdered people in Aceh, uh, stole from the people, completely threw Emil Salim's policies into a shambles. And I wonder why nobody complained. Well, let, let's, they just let's, let let's, him get let's away. Let's stick with the early period just for a second longer. Uh, Dr. Salim, you were saying that there, were, <coughs> there was an enormous necessity for some kind of action at the time, and that action was taken. But uh, I'll put to you the same question. Was the action that he took necessarily the correct one, the price that was paid in terms of human life, was that worth it? Uh, and how much of that did you agree with at the time? You must look to the problem uh, in the proper perspective. At the first time, when the, the nation was, uh, was confronted with rice shortage, food shortage, self-sufficient food becomes number one. And then necessarily, the focus of development went to the broadest base of the people, uh, to the agricultural sector. And that created that the total number of population below the poverty line, which at the time was around 40 percent by 76, but 20 years later it becomes 11 percent below the poverty line. So poverty was reduced at the time in that period. Uh, let me stop you there for a minute because I, I don't uh, disagree at all with, with your economic analysis. My question was, was the loss of life worth it? Was the loss of life the correct price to pay for solving economic problems? My point is that the loss of life when that policy, economic development, took place, and that was then in the 60s till the mid-80s, the loss of life was not taken place. The loss of life took place at the end of the 90s. So when you compare the benefits and the loss of life, you are comparing two different things, and that distorts the picture. Okay. This is my well, point. Let, let me bring Mugianto well, in here, I, I, because we've defined two time periods, and, mm -hmm. and your time period was definitively the second half yeah. uh, and into the yeah. overthrow of, of Suharto. Just, just tell me about how you felt well, about that. Uh, I, I think what happened that the, you know, that the life taken uh, during, the, or during the Suharto administration is not only happened at the end of his administration, but from the very beginning until the end. So I can mention from uh, the atrocities uh, in 65, 66, you know, the massacre and the killing, extrajudicial killing and the detention of hundreds of thousands of people accused as a communist or supporter of communists, in which they are not necessarily communists. Mm. Many of them are the nationalists, the supporter of the former president Sukarno at the time. And then later, in uh, 70s and 80s, there was also another massacre, the massacre of uh, Islamic groups in Tanjung Priok, for example, in 1984, and then another uh, Islamic uh, groups in Lampung in 1989, and also in uh, East Timor, in West Papua, in Aceh. So those are series of events in which human life were taken okay. so, on behalf so of... So by the time, by the time you became active politically, this was well towards the end of his reign, 
uh, regime, and, and you were, were clearly moved and, and very angered by what was going on. Yes. Let's go back to the beginning then. Uh, as, yes. as Dr. Asali, ba let, but we, we point is that the atrocity started from 66. Dr. Amil's point is that the economic development did great things in the mid-80s. Both are correct. He did mass murders and he developed economically. And because he developed economically, he could gain uh, political power to continue with his purges. That's how he became stronger and acted against, uh, you know, Aceh, Papua. In the end, he even got rid of good people like Emil Salim because he had enough credibility to go off on his own. But how much do you agree with the contention that at the beginning, his motives were pure and his actual deeds were pure? Well, I would be able to say that if not for the atrocities. So he, he did things in a very much a bipolar way. And in his memoirs, he refused to acknowledge the atrocities, but to claim for the deeds. Actually, the economic development was done by people like Emil Salim. He took credit for it. And people like Emil Salim never lifted their finger against the atrocities, never pointed out that Suharto has bad sides. So they let, were let being allow, used. Let yes. me allow Emil Salim, mm -hmm. Salim to respond to that. He never mentioned Suharto's bad sides. Yes. Well, at the time, it was not by design. The, press, the, the killing that was happening during the in the 65 so on was an, was an a result, was a consequence actually from the whole clash that happened between the military and the communist groups. And that is happening actually as more a result of the killing of the generals. That is point one. It is not an effort that is by design specifically being done. Second, on this Tanjong Priok case, there was a whole effort at that time to create, in, in addition to economic development, and stability of politics in which the Panchasila ideology was being promoted. Well, I don't agree with, with uh, the statement of Mr. Salim saying that all those atrocities are the excess of development. I myself believe that all are by design. So like, for example, the atrocities that happened in 65 and 66, for example, uh, it is not the excess because everything is well planned, including the what is it, the the deployment, the sending of those abuse of communists to the Buru Island, mm. isolated Buru Island. That's the state policy. The state policy, the policy of the government means that this is the design, this is the policy, and also what happened in in you know in East Timor. And also, Mr. Salim also mentioned about what happened in Tanjung Priok uh, in 80 for the massacre of the Islamic group. That is not the excess. That is the policy. And what the policy? The policy is that for the Indonesian government uh, policy to have uh, one sole ideology, and that is Pancasila. And this okay. must be applied to all organizations. Let me ask you then, if you're saying that the problems, if you like, and the killings uh, and the downside of Suharto's regime only began to manifest themselves in the second half of his regime. What caused that transition? How did we go from positive d development of, of the economy to uh, the kind of chaos that we're talking about? Uh, point one, uh, one basic principle is that I don't think it is appropriate to keep a uh, leadership for too long, is point one. Point two, when you see to the, the way the leadership takes place in Asia, take Lee Kuan Yew, take Mahathir, it's a kind of not a an, an free democracy as such, but it's a kind of a little bit guided democracy. That's just the point two. And, but the key notion here is that both, that all these type of leaders, Mahathir, Lee Kuan Yew, and also President Suharto, like to see that the development must take place first before you move into the direction of freedom of uh, democracy. Now, Let's, there is a big debate okay, whether it's correct or wrong. Why did Suharto feel that he could do what he did in East Timor? Well, impunity? because good people like Emil Salim didn't lift uh, you know, a word to prevent him. And it was only brave people like Mogianto, very few, who risked their life against him. But the mass number of people were apologists for the regime, just like you heard. They said Suharto is not really bad because he helped economic development. They refused to, even at this, in this late day, they refused to recognize that Suharto is bad. They say everybody is bad, but Suharto is good. And I just cannot see that kind of, uh, you know, statement coming from very intelligent and very decent people like Emil Salim. I'm sorry to see him have to apologize for the Suharto regime because it's a bad regime. 
period. All right, that's a good place to take a quick break. We'll pause for a moment. Please stay with us. When we return, we'll continue our discussion on Suharto, the legacy of a dictator.